Discover hope and healing from the other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Listen, they're all around you, close as a thought or a memory. Messages of Hope. Messages of Hi, everybody. Welcome back for a special episode of the podcast. Part two. We didn't know there was going to be a part two when we did part one to an interview with Dr. Jim Cragg, a medical doctor, psychiatrist, who's very interested in a topic called the noosphere. But I want to tell you, that's not the way we put the topic on the YouTube thumbnail. I'm not one to resonate with doom and gloom and hype, but I knew that if we put a title like what is the noosphere, we would not have captured a lot of people's attention. So my wonderful assistant, Lynette, gave it the title, Will Humanity Be Wiped Out? And because of that title, instead of just a few thousand views, we have uh, tens of thousands of views already. And a lot of questions, a lot of interest in this topic. And a lot of people said, I want more. I never heard of this. It's intriguing. So here we go with part two of the noosphere. But this one is more like, will humanity survive? And happily, it's a very hopeful subject. The answer we believe is yes. And I would like to bring back into the interview, Dr. Jim Craig. Welcome back, Jim. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we were talking beforehand that uh, you you thought that the 26,000 views we had so far was pretty good until you saw some video about a cat that had like, several million views, right? <laughs> it's good for humility, isn't it? It is. Oh, but speaking of views, before we get started, I do want to remind everyone, I'm going to be channeling my guide, Sanaya, who you'll hear some excerpts from them written out in this session. I'm going to be channeling them 100% for charity for Care Camps for Kids, a uh, beautiful organization that sends kids with cancer to camps in the summer so they can get away from all the sickness and, and simply be a kid. And that is more healing than often anything we can do for them. So let me throw up here for a sec, throw up on the screen here, a uh, little bit of a notice about that. If you go to my website, SuzanneGiesman.com, just scroll down a little, you'll find some thumbnails there for details on that November 20th live channeling event and all registration funds, which are up to you how much you contribute. Go directly to Care Camps for Kids. And anytime I channel Sanaya, the energy is palpable. We all learn something and we feel this incredible love and sense of community. So I hope you'll join us. It's gonna be another wonderful event. So thank you for that. Now, Jim, we talked about you starting with a recap of the, the highlights of session one. It was, a, it was nice to talk about the news here and I enjoyed it. and. One of the main reasons we did this was because Sanaya had mentioned the word a couple of times in in um, passing, and I thought it was very important. The, Teilhard also spoke, Teilhard de Chardin is who we're talking about. He's the originator of the word newosphere. He lived from 1881 until 1955. He was a Jesuit priest, uh, scientist, paleontologist, geologist, and, uh, and uh, mystic, really. Trouble is, he's very difficult to read. And and I can attest to that because I feel several, a lot of people wrote to me and emailed me that they were interested in the subject. I dove into the, the subject. I like reading his works as interpreted by others because when I read his, mm -hmm. his words translated from French into English, it went right over my head, first to admit it. It's, it's easy to do, partly because he's from, yeah, he's a man from the two centuries back, 1881, he was born. And so he, they, 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 he wrote long, long sentences, sometimes a whole paragraph that's one sentence. And plus, it's just a different way of thinking, plus the translation, plus the science. So there's a lot. And he was too scientific for his theologian friends and too theological for his science friends. So he kind of fell through the cracks, although really he ended up being one of the more influential thinkers in the end of the 1900s, for sure. Definitely brilliant. And, and I... I totally resonate with his theological uh, assumptions, beliefs. Right. He, he, he definitely believed in consciousness being primary and that consciousness preceded life. And, and even in early life, consciousness was present and then it became much more manifest 
as the very complex organism of Homo sapien came about. So it's, but it's not that we're originators of consciousness, it's we're, we're reflecting consciousness, which is much more in tune with the Vedic concept, although he really wasn't into Vedic philosophy or Indian philosophy, but it really resonates with that. And also very much with some of the new newer scientific ideas of quantum mechanics, where um, you know scientists for a long time have been very um, physicalist, or some would say materialist, where whatever they can see is what's real. But what help? What's happening is that people are realizing that material is non-material. Matter is not not made of matter. It's made of of energy, and and there's fields of energy and intelligence, and so. There's big changes going on. So there's more people open to this idea now than I think there once was. But, you know, while you say all that, it's, it, I absolutely concur with that. But it sounds so dry. What I loved about reading Teilhard's work is that he was one of the first that introduced the concept of God being evolutionary, that that everything that exists arises from. We talk about consciousness. We can call it God. But it's all about evolving, bringing more love. Love is the key here. Love is totally the key. In fact, I think it's a good point to read this. On October 20th, Sanaya had a message that I'm going to read. They're, they're brief. And it's fit in with today's topic. Love is not what you think it is. What you believe love to be is but a fraction of these, this energetic force that holds all things together. You experience connection and attraction with another, and you call it love. Yes, this is closer to the idea than a mere emotion. Think even bigger. Think of the force that holds the planets in their orbits. Now think even bigger. Love is the prime mover, the creative impulse of the universe. Now we ask you, how could love ever die? And there it is. So I, I thought I would start with some quotes that, that they are that a lot of people have heard but may not realize it was coming from him. One that often gets read. Um, in fact, I think it was at, at the... Uh, I, uh, last time I heard it publicly was we were in England, no, no, where were we? We were in France, and the British, the, the British wedding for what was that couple that uh, the prince and the princess when they got married, an, an American read this quote by Teilhard: "Someday, after mastering the winds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love, and on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire." Huh. This other quote that we, we hear people say a lot, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. He wrote that in the 30s. That's a very common. I had, you hear that all the time. I had no idea that was attributed to him. Then this one, driven by the forces of love, the fragments of the world seek each other so that the world may come into being. I love that one because it's like whether it's atom to atom forming a molecule or molecules coming together to pour cells or or galaxies coming together in, in a gravitational attraction. It's it's being for being pulling together. And it's that that's like the gravity, that magnetic attraction. That's it's like the gravity. It, it's, it's what like, calls all of us to listen to programs like this. We're just attracted to it because the the soul wants us to evolve in love. It's he also talked about the the individual particle trembling at the approach of the rest. It's sort of like a piece of metal trembling near a magnet. It's like we are on our core level love. So when we get attracted to something that has a similar quality, the being for being, we're attracted to it. So this knowledge would attract people. Let's see. Uh, then this is a nice one. There is neither matter nor spirit in the world. The stuff of the universe is spirit matter. He saw a very nice unity between the two. So according to Teilhard, love is the most universal, formidable, and mysterious of cosmic energy the fundamental impulse of life, the bloodstream of evolution. Its aim is the great work of union, of communion. For the world to truly flourish, our love must extend around the globe to all persons of whatever persuasion. And then lastly, the age of nations is past. The task before us now, if we wish not to perish, is to build the earth. Hmm. So I, I love those sentiments and that concept. Um, you know, so well, you're talking about building the earth, and that brings us back now. We need to recap what this concept, and Teilhard originated it, is the, or did he, the concept of the noosphere, and what is that? He did, and there's, and if you read about things in Wikipedia and so forth, there's this other a Russian scientist that seems to be 
given credit. But when you look back through the history, I've, I've, I've delved into it fairly deeply. Taher is the one that really first published the idea and came up with it. But it's interesting that Vernatsky, a Russian geologist, also is credited with that. It doesn't matter in a way. New ideas come up together and we all own all of them. But, but the idea of the noosphere is that just like there's the geosphere, the earth and the biosphere of life, the sphere of life, out of uh, the past million couple of years of evolution, the, the noosphere, the, the sphere of humans has come about and it encompasses everything that's related to humans, Suzanne. It's, it's, it's whatever we see that's related to humans. And that includes the intangibles. Of course, our roads and our and our houses, and that's that's part of the new sphere, but also the intangibles, such as our laws and our cultural um, mores and, and our governmental systems, and also the, the television and, and internet waves that are passing through us. Anything that's related to humanity that, since it's a spherical planet, it goes around the planet. And so there's this sphere of humanity. Some would call it the brain of Earth. You know, you brought up last time the concept of Gaia a little bit. And I, I, I chose not last time to use it, but we, since it's something that a lot of people know of, Gaia is uh, James Lovelock in the late 70s uh, came up with the Gaia hypothesis along with Lynn Margulis. They were very much... Um, uh, physicalists, if you would, they, they don't see any spiritual sense. Both of them had uh, no spiritual beliefs whatsoever, and they they saw it much more as a mechanistic thing. But they, the, the, the Gaia hypothesis was very interesting um, in, in the sense that it, it, um, it talks about a, a self-regulating planet. So it's not so much that Earth is alive as life on Earth is interacting in such a way as to self-regulate, which is a very fascinating concept in and of itself, but it's very different from saying that Earth is an organism or the newosphere is, uh, is an organism as, as if for the brain of Earth. So, but what we could think of, I thought of a subtlety that may help people on this is, is that if they want to think of Gaia as you know, Mother Earth, it's, um, then the newosphere would be the, the nervous system for Gaia. It would be more like the heart and brain of Earth. Yeah. In fact, this somebody actually emailed me a photo of a page of a book talking about the noosphere. And I wrote down three phrases of definition, a spherical shell of psychic energy, a thinking network, exactly what you're saying, like a vast nervous system that continues to grow and densify. That's the evolutionary part. And intensify very rapidly. One of the... One of the, the phrases that I used last time was that if you put the whole history of the earth four and a half billion years into a one calendar year, that humans would be just on the last few seconds of the last day of the year. I mean, it's really hard to think about. Even dinosaurs came in the last week of December. And so it's like we're talking about a big span of time. But the nice thing that I give, I feel a lot of hope for is we're babies, you know, the, the new sphere and humans are just babies. We're, we're, we're moving very quickly. And because of, uh, uh, you know, we've got our son, before our son poops out on us, we've got another few billion years left to go. So there's a lot of hope that things can change. But it takes using Sanaya's viewpoint, which I think it's worth reviewing too, is Sanaya in that one talk was pointing out that what we're here to try and learn is to have these except all four viewpoints. One is an individual eye-centered one. One is a group-centered viewpoint. And hang on a second. So this is so key. I want to go through this just a little bit more slowly for everybody. Mm -hmm. That uh, My guides and many others have talked about, we have shifting perspectives. That's our beautiful choice of free will that we have as multidimensional beings. And we can choose our viewpoint when the first one that Jim talked about is the eye-centered, meaning I, me. So it's the me, me, me-centered viewpoint. And then group-centered, our tribe, my people, right? Group-centered is the next perspective. And then the, the global or centered, and then the cosmic-centered. And what Sanaya was saying is that with each shift in the lens, we get a different view entirely, and the view, the result of the view is greater peacefulness, greater awareness, greater... Um, just that, but both are, but all of them are important. And we can't, you know, we're stuck in the first one for sure, no matter what we do. 
but but it's it's not where we have to stay. You know? And it's not that either anyone is worse. It's just a different lens and an opportunity to grow from that viewpoint. But when we stay only in the I, let me say in the self, the smaller self, it leads to, to confusion, frustration. And one of the things Teilhard talked about, because he was living during the post-war of one and two, where there was a lot of um, of existentialism and a lot of futility and a lot of people feeling like, oh my God, we're going to hell here. This is this is not easy to see why he would have that feeling and so many people would. But his, his feeling was that no, we need hope to change the perspective and we'll see if we look in perspective, there's a lot of good things happening. Yeah, that's true. I was thinking about that too, that right now we look around and we, we say the world's going to hell, it's really awful, but you look back at the at the millions of lives in World War One and World War Two, and hopefully we don't get go any further than that. And that's what discussions like this are all about, showing us that the change in perspective changes everything. You know, one of the words you introduced me to in one of your talks was cymetics, C Y M A T I C S, cymetics. And and I so I looked on YouTube, and there's some fascinating videos mm -hmm. of people. They have these plates or dishes where they sprinkle some sand or some, and then they put a different tone on it and then it goes into a pattern and then they go to a different tone and it goes to a new pattern. So I thought of a metaphor. If if we were one grain of sand in comparison on that plate and they started the vibration going, we think, whoa, what's going on here? Wait a second. This is something terrible is happening. I'm vibrating all over the place. Huh. And we wouldn't see the pattern that's coming about. We wouldn't see the positive change, the beauty of the pattern that's coming about. Wow. I think that's that's an interesting way to think of the changes we're in because we're in the self-centered, the eye-centered viewpoint instead of the global-centered viewpoint. What we're feeling is the trauma of the vibration. We're, we're feeling the, the, the scariness of the change. Boy, that is a great metaphor. You all should Google later cymatics or go on YouTube, look up cymatics because really it takes a just randomly scattered sand and turns into what look like crop circles, intelligent patterns and that is beautiful you're absolutely correct we can't see the bigger picture my guides Sanaya talk about that all the time from this limited viewpoint but in expanded states of awareness or mind journeys even when in normal waking consciousness we can get at least a somewhat less limited picture one of the things i thought with our review is, is it'll help if we address some of the questions so why don't we tackle some of those at this point i love that and the, what Jim is talking about is the questions that some of you submitted after watching the video of part one. Some of them quite challenging, actually. Well, you're going to be doing it from which viewpoint, Jim? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. We'll try for the, the global we'll cosmic the view. Global cosmic atmospheric point of view. Or, but we can just show the difference the change of viewpoint makes. So I'll read the question. And let's see. One gentleman said, uh, several people commented on a wariness of global or large government organizations, because we talked about us becoming more of a global uh, species, right? Yeah, he, so. he saw the tendency for for humanity to converge, to coalesce, to cooperate. And so what happens is over time, I mean, at one point there were just hunter-gather societies, then there were Fertile, you know, there were the Fertile Crescent, and these, and then it came some early empires, and and gradually it's gotten bigger and bigger, and 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 as the result of of some of the great wars, we things have even gotten bigger, and and so it's valid for people to be concerned about what will happen in, in terms of of how that will go for us, and and I I I thought, you know, there's no promises and what's going to happen. There's no guarantees, but the tendency he saw was towards planetization, where we increasingly, as that one quote that I read. Are you talking about Teilhard? Teilhard, yeah, yeah, yeah. The age of nations is past, he said. The task before us, if we would not perish, is to build the earth. And so how, how is that going to come about? And I thought of, it, for me as a physician, one I think biologically a lot, I think of the human body. So I thought, you know, in our bodies, the estimation is we have about 37 trillion cells. Now, that's a lot of cells, and, you know, it's inconceivably large. I won't go into how the people have estimated that number, but 37 trillion. And most of the time, you know, so my body has is a society of individual cells. 
most of the time the cells get along. You know, there's, they're following the law, so to speak, of natural law of how to take care of each other and how. Now, each cell has to become individualized. Each cell has to become maximally diversified for them to work. And that's parallel, parallel in society to a successful society will have free individuals that have maximized their individual potential. But here's the key, and this is a big one, they're part of a body. So when my heart is beating blood around, it's not going just to some places, it's going everywhere. When, when my lungs take in oxygen and, and expel carbon dioxide, it's taken from every cell, not just a few select cells. When my antibodies are, are fighting some virus, it takes care of the whole body. So society is going to have to, if we're going to be planetized, we're going to have to figure out and accommodate how to live in tune with natural law the way our bodies do, where we're, where we're individualized but part of a whole. It'll be part of the, go ahead, you look like you're going to say something. Well, it's just that taking in mind the metaphor you use of us being humanity in the history of the world, the, the universe, cosmos, just the last few seconds of the full year in that shrunk down existence. We are so young that we can't even conceive, we can conceive of it now, but it's not ready to happen. But uh, let's bring this back to the noosphere. That being a network could actually draw us towards that. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because one of the things he talked about is the increasing need for he used the word sympathy, which is a parallel synonym for love, for cell to cell, so to speak, or human to human. It won't work unless we can develop that. In fact, one of the best laws that, that was ever developed was the golden rule of treat others as you wish to be treated. And it's come up independently in, in various cultures. Virtually every culture has come up with a different way of saying that same law. And so if the body can do it, we can do it. There's only, you know, people are really worried about the size of the population on the planet, and justifiably so. We're up to about 8 billion people now. But 8 billion compared to 37 trillion is nothing. I mean, that's like, so if the if my, if, if, if each of us has a society of cells which are cooperating and functioning in a harmony, why can't the whole earth, which is also a growing organism? There's no reason, theoretically, why this can't occur. It's just hard for us to see it happening. But but in terms of the question of could it be or is it totally unrealistic, it's very realistic because we have models of it all around, including in our own body of how this can be. But we'll have to follow certain principles, certain ways of behaving. And you know what occurs to me is our body is imbued with consciousness, and it's the same consciousness that is coursing through every organism, every creation. And so... If we can simply learn to stop being so I centered and allow consciousness to flow and unite all of us with the noosphere doing its job of magnetizing us towards each other, then there is the hope for humanity. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of hope because we're changing. I mean, look, I don't know how many people are listening to this today, but all of us are hoping for more hope or helping for more love. And we're all in the process of developing it. And more and more people are. I see a lot of positive changes. There's so many non-governmental organizations that have been springing up that are very generous and loving and caring organizations. They don't have to do that. Those are all society, evolutionary. These are very new things, and they're just popping up all over the place. And, and they're designed, it's, it's a self-correcting mechanism where the noosphere is working to bring more orderliness. But where does order come from? It comes from connecting to pure consciousness, which is the basis of orderliness. That's so it. to be successful, our body taps into natural law. And the more we function in tune with natural law, the healthier and more fulfilled we become. And, and so that's where the hopelessness that we see in people comes from. They don't realize they're part of a whole. Exactly. If you think you're separate and individual and acting all alone, you, you would give up hope. But the more you sit in the silence and sense your true nature that's right here, you know that we are part of this one complete whole and the noosphere is just one level within levels and levels and levels of connection. That's absolutely right. And the one of the reasons why I feel very passionate about promoting this concept is that I think words, words are very important concepts. They, they hold very important concepts. And so just an understanding of the noosphere, it's from a biological point of view. I mean, Bernatsky, the fellow we talked about, who also used it, he was an atheist, but, it, but he talked about it helped him understand 
the way that, that the whole earth is functioning together. So the point is that it's a biological concept, but it, it supports the concept that we're all connected, that we're whole. And, you know, words make a big difference, don't they, in concepts. I was thinking recently, you know, Galileo was is accredited with being one of the really the forerunners for helping us change from the, the sun moving around the earth to the earth moving around the sun. I started thinking at one time, you know, it would be interesting to talk to his baker or his cobbler and think, what do you think of Galileo? You know, it's like, and, and what do you think? Does it matter to you at all whether the sun goes around the earth or the earth goes around the sun? And, and I don't think that that knowledge made much difference to people. Hmm. But we were raised with that concept that the earth goes around the sun, that we're in a solar system. And it, it causes us to think much bigger, much more broadly. It's expanded our view. We're in the midst, Suzanne, of a change that's way bigger than that of the, going from a geocentric to a heliocentric. We're going from the point of view where we're understanding that consciousness is primary. Yeah. That is huge. I mean, and, 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 the, and the concept of the newsphere feeds into that very much so because it helps us understand the network that we're connected with. And because then, consciousness is indivisible and flowing. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it also guides us to what we can do to improve our consciousness to connect more with the universal natural law that pre exists. But it, it helps. I think it's a concept that helps guide us in the future and will help organize our direction of activity a little bit more. Okay, cool. Why don't we move on to the second question? Okay. It's good stuff. Hope you all are enjoying this. It's very, it's, it's, I have to make sure my head doesn't explode, right? And just stay present with this. It really requires presence. <laughs> I got the good helpers here from Sanaya. They're helping me. So, next question, a comment. No doubt there is some comfort in the cosmic perspective where thousands of years of evolution can be seen as but a few seconds of cosmic time. But can a focus on the cosmic ameliorate, lessen the immediate problems and pain of the I perspective of a single human life, which is after all valid and cosmic of you as any other and is apparently the one we were all sent here to deal most directly with? Well, that's a long, deep question. It is, but I like it. And I, I, I mean, I think, and, I, and when I think of that, first thing I think of is Teilhard. And since we're focusing on Teilhard, it brings me to him. He was a priest, right? A Jesuit priest. And he lived during World War I, which was a terrible war that uh, we all know about. He could have hid out in a, in a monastery somewhere, but he volunteered as a young man to be a stretcher bearer on the front lines. So what's my point? My point is that having this broad view does not in any way mean you don't have sensitivity to the pain and frustrations and fears of individuals. It doesn't mean, as you pointed out, that we don't, when, when we have this self or I-centered viewpoint, it doesn't mean we pretend that that's not true. You know, if we stub our toe, it hurts. It's nice to be spiritual and broad-minded, broad but it hurts and we have to deal with that pain. And he, he did. And interestingly, it was during the, it was in the trenches that he started writing about the newosphere and the spiritual nature of humanity, which is really amazing, I think. So my experience has been, that, as I already mentioned, some of these non-governmental organizations that help people with food or clothing or, or, or stress or whatever. You know, there's so many of them. We're cleaning up the environment. Those people that start those and work in them, my experience has been that they're very broad-minded individuals. They're not narrow-minded, they think broadly. And that breadth of thinking, it, it's like to give, you have to have. And, to, and one of the best ways to have is to think broadly and to connect with that broader self that you are a part of already. So I don't think that, you know, although it's, it's true that, it, that having this broad view won't stop the pain of, of a refugee drowning or, 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 or a bomb falling on somebody and the trauma that that brings. That's very true. But I think it, we're sent here also, so to speak. We, we choose to be born on this planet, not to just have a cushy, easy life. We're here to experience the contrast and to learn these four things, that we're much more than this body, that we're whole and holy and we're, we're growing. And so, you know, I think that one of the, we're here not to just to have, you know, have everything nice and everybody to agree, but we're, 
going through contrasts, knowledge and experience through these combined opposites. And and the, the, the best lesson to learn is how to give and receive love. So that comes through being in the trenches, so to speak, like Teilhard was. You know, when I, I finished the show last week my, or two weeks ago, the first one with you, my husband was uh, discussing it with me and he was so impressed by Teilhard, the priest who volunteered to be the stretcher bearer. And he went and he Googled him immediately. He said he even won the French Medal of Valor in the war. So definitely, I love how you brought him into that with that, the, yes, you're centered on the self, but you also are global. That's just the whole thing. We are individual, but we are also part of a whole. Right. Beautiful. Very, very important. So there's a second part to the same person's comment and question. Uh, Dr. Craig's cosmic perspective, while real and true and destined to manifest, I love that he wrote that and acknowledged that, is no escape clause and should not be used as an excuse for mental laziness or throwing our hands up in obscurity and confusion. We should be better than that. I agree totally. That's the that's you know one of the things that Taylor talked about was the idea that we are evolution made conscious of itself, and I, I that's a very profound concept, uh, and it really is really important to wrap your mind around, I think. And, and, and but it, 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 then it, what it leads us to is that we have to choose our conscious evolution. We have to choose what we're doing here. And so we need to seek solutions. We need to, it, it, as I said earlier, I don't believe that the future, we're, the way that we are now, we, we as humans, and the way the newest are is, we, we can't argue that we're the preeminent species on the planet. In fact, some would say we're a cancer on the planet. At the least, we're, we're the preeminent species on the planet. We've covered the whole planet and we're touching everything and we're causing in any event. The future of life on this planet depends on us, really. So we've got to pull our act together, which means we have to consciously evolve. We have to think about how we're going to clean things up, how we're going to live together in peace, how we're going to. We can't just be pessimistic and, and, and pretend that oh, this is some kind of paradise, everything's good. It's No, that's not the case. Can't you see how that absolutely depends on us getting out of the, not only the I perspective, not especially getting out of the, the group perspective, but into the global and cosmic perspectives. That's the saving grace there. And happily, the noosphere is pulling us towards that. Yeah, I think as we coalesce together, we can't think any other way other than together. We've got to figure out how we're going to do this together, even the nice analogy that uh, you brought up that tonight has of, you know, we're, it's like one tree, one tree of life and one tree has lots of leaves on it. So it's like we, we're all one tree. We need to be conscious, just like we're buying back to the example of me with the body, we're trillion, 37 trillion cells. We, this hand has to be conscious of this hand. We have to work together, even though it's far apart. Yes, I, have, if I have an itch up here. I'm going to scratch it. It's 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 like we have to help each other on this planet. We're all part of the same life. And I know this sounds kumbaya to, to many people who, who haven't explored those higher uh, perspectives, but it's all part of our own nature. So it's just here to be explored. Let's move on to the next one. Let's see. There are many different cultures on our planet, and migration means they're now mixing together. Unfortunately, not all cultures are of the same mindset that we all are one, and this leads to conflict. There will be deaths due to this rush to mix vastly different cultures together. This used to make me angry, upset, and worried, but now I try to focus on what I know to be true and that there is no death and we are all evolving together, just some at a different pace to others. Well, that's really true, isn't it? You know, when you look around on Earth, there's pockets of organization, there's pockets of tolerance, there's pockets of kindness, and there's pockets of really intolerance as well. I, uh, this question leads me to thinking about Afghanistan as, as a kind of a caricature example, of, particularly for women, but also for men, of, of intolerance and, and restrictiveness. But, but now I, it also makes me think, since I talked about immigrants last time, and this is dealing with immigrants and mixing of cultures, Think of an Afghan family that, that immigrated or, you know, it's a refugee, became a refugee in Sweden or Tulsa, Oklahoma or somewhere. You know, it doesn't really matter. Somewhere in the, in, in the Western world where they they have an incredibly different level of freedom and much, much different experience of tolerance. And think of their kids going to school, how they're going to experience things. But now let's extend it again. Don't just think in one generation. Think of 
the next two or three or four generations, what are the relatives of the Afghan family that used to have heritage of Afghanistan? How are they going to be behaving? The potential is great, great that they're going to be living in a much more free, much more open, much more tolerant society. So I do see progress potential there. I mean, I've seen it in immigrants in many places, which is one of the reasons why I think having having a mixture of cultures is a very healthy thing. And the the other thing is, think of the people left behind in Afghanistan. Well, they, I, I wouldn't want to be one of them for sure. But even there, they can't expect they can't escape the planetization. I mean, I started. I think about the fact that you know they're driving Toyotas made in Japan. Their their shoes are probably made in Vietnam or China. Their cell phones are made somewhere in North Korea. I mean, South Korea, or then they're designed in the United States. So even there, where there's very great restriction. And, and they're, they're, they're relying on the world to do satellite imaging and, and communicate amongst each other. So we're growing. And as you said at the beginning of this show, which really expanded my mind, is that even those products are part of the noosphere. Even those products are part of the noosphere. They, they can't avoid it. Again, if we think back to other species, there's no other species that has anything close to what we've got. If, if a squirrel in, 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 uh, in Germany develops some new uh, mutation, it stays there. It doesn't, doesn't go over to uh, you know, a squirrel in Arizona. And, and yet with the, new, with the newest here, with human society, if we develop a new tool somewhere, a new invention somewhere, it can go everywhere. It, it doesn't have to change or depend on our human genes for it to to be shared, it immediately goes everywhere, which is one of the reasons why the newospheric evolution is going so quickly, because we as humans have not backed into the blind alley of somatic specialization, meaning we're not making our bodies specialized. We're relying, you know, if we want to dive deep, we don't have to do like the walruses did and take millions of years. We, 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 we invent wetsuits and scuba. If we want to fly, we don't have to get new feathers. We You see what I'm getting at. It's yeah. like, even our, our communication, um, you know, it's like the other day I was talking to a friend on cell phones. I'm here in Virginia and he's in Rishikesh, India. Hmm. And it's like, wow, what's going on here? This is somebody had mentioned somebody, one of the questions about telepathy. And I think, well, that's a type of telepathy, isn't it? I mean, it's telephony, but it's telepathy because... I could hear him speaking clear as, clear as a bell. And there he was way far away in, in, in the mountains well, of India. Let's just make my work really real. I remember doing a reading for a woman in Azerbaijan. Yeah. And, and, having, and talking to a loved one of hers across the veil who is showing me a pomegranate. And she said, oh, yeah, that's the national fruit of Azerbaijan. So we're using technology to communicate halfway around the world and talking to someone who is in consciousness only, who's everywhere. So as we develop our consciousness, consciousness may become, our communication may actually become more telepathic like mediumship is. Absolutely. And in fact, when you think about, I, I'm not an adept with, with uh, mental telepathy, but the only one I've really clearly had that tie with is my wife and we, we love each other. And so when I think that the, it's easiest between people that have sympathy, have connection, but as Tara talked about, as the global newsphere grows more tight and as we develop more sympathy and more love for each other, I suspect that the ease with which we will have telepathy occurring will be greater and greater. That is, that's one of the key points. And we could just highlight that one right there in this program. It's that this noosphere is developing more tightly and we telepathically communicate using love. When I, when I start a reading, the first thing I do is establish that heart connection with my client and with their loved ones. And that's what makes the communication more clear. So I love what you say there, Jim, that as we come to love and respect and appreciate each other, our communication will increase between each other. And that just becomes this evolutionary uh, snowball. You know that exercise you sometimes have people do at your workshops where you have them send out a message to somebody and ask them to contact you. It wouldn't work if it wasn't with people that we knew and loved. That's right. It would, but as we get more and more people that we love and connect, it will be easier and easier. It will just be like, and again, I, I think, when okay, 
If I dial my friend, punch, 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 some number, that signal goes all around the globe and finds him up in Rishikesh, India. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, now when you sign, when you go and do your medium work, you tune into somebody, you're not punching in numbers, but you're calling them up. It's the same sort of a thing. Yep. In fact, you know, I want to comment on the, the fact that your mediumship work and, and, and people like Bruce Grayson's work with near-death experiences and Brian Weiss's work with, with, with uh, past life re regression and things like that, those are very important concepts that expand our worldview in terms of the new sphere because the, many biologists, one of the freedoms I'm having enjoying talking with, with your audience today and the other day was because I'm not pulling punches or trying to explain. If I was talking to a group of biologists about the new sphere, I would be speaking very differently because the belief, you know, yeah. just Galileo got in trouble with the bishops of, of, of Rome but there's a church of science that, that is very much uh, very restrictive and 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 uh, the, the scientism is it's a belief that many people have and if you cross that you're in trouble you know Gary Schwartz has talked about this and others that are involved in research on these sorts of things is that they can't get published or they can't get tenure it's it's so but there's a change taking place in any event one of the things that's greatly helped is things like mediumship or, or experiences from people that have near death because you can't argue with the results. Yeah. Evidence-based mediumship for sure, when we get the verifiable yeah. information. Evidence. When you get verifiable information or when you have somebody who dies and they come back and they talk about things that other were going on with clarity yeah. in the next room or the next town, what, what are you gonna do with that? I mean, you can, or what, what if you get somebody, a child that has a, a, a memory from a previous existence and it's verifiably correct? What are you going to do with that is expand your belief system. And as, with, with a lot of people I know, they just can't tolerate it. They just say, no, it's not true. It's not true. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, it's like, don't tell me that. But if you're open-minded, you realize, no, it's it, what are we going to do with that? And one of the things we can do with it is to realize consciousness is primary. It's not just a brain phenomenon. It's much broader than that. So it helps. It makes it easier to accept the, the linkage and the web of the newest here, to me anyway. Beautiful. Okay. Let's move on to the next question or comment from somebody from part one of this program. Uh, the person wrote, it's very beautiful to think one country, one love, but how would that work? There are leaders in other countries who have bad intentions and are very ego centered. How would we keep our individualism and freedom if we're under one government? And would that government allow for freedom and how much? In theory, it's beautiful, like a utopia. And I wish more people would follow the teachings of Christ, love thy neighbor and compassion with forgiveness for all. I hope humanity becomes kinder to one another. We're still far from truly loving beings, even though many more are awakening, so many more still need to. We've pretty much touched on this already, but. We can touch that even a little deeper though, I think, because it's it's very, that sentiment is so, so nice really, the idea that, we, we, we need to be more loving, more more centered. How are we going to keep our freedom? And I guess my sense on that is to, the way I deal with it anyway, is I look back historically. And I think, I mean, that, that concept made me think about, okay, there's something called Pax Romana, which was the Roman peace, which occurred, it was about a 200-year period, I believe. I'm no historian, but it was, around uh, approximately 50 BC to 150 AD. It's, those aren't exact numbers, but it's around in that period. And it was a period of great, relative to the time anyway, peace and harmony. And there was a lot of invention that was, was shared and, and cohesion that was going on all through what's now Europe and around the Mediterranean. But it was only part of the whole Roman Empire, which went from about 600 years earlier to about 400 years later, so a period of about 1,100 years. Well, I'll tell you, even though that was a sort of the people, historians call that the golden age of Rome, I wouldn't live there if you paid me. I, I, went, I mean, where we are now is so much more advanced, so much more peaceful, so much more supportive of humanity. So in 2000, measly 2,000 years, We've grown hugely. So again, when you think of the Earth, the history of the Earth and the calendar year, we, the, the Roman, you know, it was, it was just a few seconds ago that Caesar was murdered, 
and and relatively speaking. And so here we are, near two thousand years later, and look at the difference between the Pax Romana and what we are experiencing today. And to recap what my guide said, those were the dark ages and these are the dim ages, right? So it's these an improvement. Are the these are the dim ages. But, you know, that, that brings up a concept that I really like the Marsh used to talk about in terms of if you have a dark room and, and, you, and you want, what do you do to get rid of the darkness? Well, absolutely, there's nothing you can do to the darkness because darkness isn't something. Darkness is an absence of photons of light. So even from a point of view of physics, we could say that darkness does not exist. Now, we can certainly say that the state of darkness is a real descriptor, but it's not a descriptor of something that is. It's a descriptor of something that isn't. Hmm. So how do we get rid of the darkness? Well, obviously, we bring in light. And even one little candle in a dark room that's very dim, but you can start to see your way around. We're, we're in the dim ages, but it's way better than the total dark ages. And we got a bunch of candles listening and watching yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. Exactly right. And so we're in the process of turning up our light and learning how to do that and growing with that. And in fact, let's 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 turn on to that. Let's go to that because I realize suddenly that we're nearly done. And to me, the concept of where, where evolution made conscious of itself means we have to consciously evolve. Someone else had said to comment, give me an example of something I can do to make That's my right. life come up. That's right. So I, I think that's a really important, very important concept to look at is what can we do as individuals? And and one of the things that I think is important is that, you know, as a psychiatrist for ages, the whole field of psychiatry and psychology has been looking at problems and pathology. But in the past decades, really since around the late 90s and, and the early 2000s, there's been a whole movement to look at positive psychology. What makes life worth living? What makes life fulfilling? And, and, and so I've been doing a lot of research on that since I retired, and there are a lot of things that can be done. And, and, and one of the things that I think is really important is meditation. You, you put that forward and it's something that you, you, you talk about regularly and the need for people to do. But the concept of why would meditation be so important to turn up our light? Because we're full of light already. The problem is we're, we're hiding it. So meditation doesn't bring on more light. It gets rid of what's hiding the darkness, what's hiding, the, you know, what's causing the darkness. The things and that are some people may not even know that light is within them. They don't, they haven't, that's so obscured. They have, they just don't realize it till you clear away the clouds. There's, there's a lovely saying in the, the Bhagavad Gita is one of the, the ancient texts that, from India that deals with, with yoga and union. And there's this one verse that I especially like where it talks about Arjuna, Lord Krishna is having a conversation with Arjuna, and he says, "Be without the three gunas, which are the three, which are the qualities of life. Or, be without your story, is the way you would maybe say it." And and it said, "Freed from duality, ever firm in purity, independent of possessions, possessed of the self." So it's like when you meditate, what you're doing is you're going away from the duality, all the separateness. You're going towards a more inner wholeness. You know, you're finding purity. That's the pure consciousness. You're not just in the filters on the outside. You you go inward to a level of purity and pure consciousness. When you're in that level, when you let loose your story, you don't own your car. You don't own your house. You're just you're just pure consciousness. You're just your capital S self, and that's why it says then possessed of the self. So it's a very beautiful concept for what meditation is doing. And then uh, Lord Krishna exhorts Arjuna to then. Established in yoga, which yoga means union, or instead perform action. So the idea is we meditate and then we act. We meditate and then we act. We get in, break the boundaries, back in the boundaries. Go to the cosmic self, go to the individual self. You know, go to the global self, go to the individual self. Keep alternating between those perspectives, and gradually we we have more light to share. So that's that's a very that's one thing that the, the person asked what to do. Start with meditation. There's another one that I, I would just like. invite everybody to check out my YouTube video, Sip of the Divine. Anybody can find three minutes a day to meditate. There's another one that I like a lot. Again, it seems very simple, but it's far from simplistic. And there's good research that have been done at different universities to support it entirely. And it's 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 to deal with more gratitude. I knew and, that you're going to say that. And that's it. Oh yeah. 
And there's a system that uh, a friend of mine and we've been we're working on. We're just about done with a book on using positive psychology interventions aimed primarily at people with anxiety and depression. But the way we systematize, and I'll share it with people here, it's very, it helps, I think, is to get a journal or you can use your computer and you start by writing the date. That's to look and see how you're doing because change is hard. And so being consistent is difficult. So you put the date. And then the first thing you do is you write about something you've noticed that's funny, peaceful, or beautiful. Just a sentence or two. Then the second thing you do is you talk about one interaction with another person that seemed to go well. So it helps you tune your focus towards looking at good interactions. The third thing is just something you're grateful for. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It could be grateful for your, you have this fountain pen that you really like or a hot shower you had, anything. And the fourth thing is one thing you've done in recent 24 hours or so that you're pleased with, proud of, or appreciate. One thing you've done. And that's not bragging. It's like we're, we're so good at negative self-talk of criticizing and picking on ourselves. So it helps us get in the habit of noticing something we've done that we're pleased with, proud of, or appreciate. And fourthly, if you're in a relationship, you could write about one thing your partner's done that you're pleased with, proud of, or appreciate. And if you did that day to day to day, the, the pages would fill. And then on those days that inevitably you have problems or things go bad, you wouldn't be able to validly say nothing is working because you would have pages of things that are working. Oh, you, I love this. you wouldn't be able to say, you know, nobody likes me because you would have pages of things where you had good interaction. And so it helps build up your emotional bank account. I use that term that some of us have heard. And, it, it, and like, you're building up the newosphere. And you're building up the newosphere okay. because the more, the more you can be happy, the more that you can be sharing your light. There's one third one that I want to share because it's very practical. There's a website people can go to that, that would be free called viacharacter.org. V-I-A, like Victor, I-A, character.org. You mean spell out the word character? Character.org, right. Um, uh, Martin Seligman and Christopher Peterson developed this concept of they, they looked up, they worked at looking into instead of what's the problems in people, character strengths and virtues. Is that it? VIA character.org. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And you can go to there, and, and what they found is that there's about 24 various character strengths that are grouped into six virtues. And I could list them if we have time. I don't know if we have time, but no, they let people go there. <laughs> and they can take a brief test for free. And it will help them see what their signal strengths are. Mm -hmm. What's the usefulness of that? It, it's helpful to understand where our strengths are. We, we're well adapted with what our weaknesses are. But if we get character, if we understand our strengths and we strengthen them, we find more joy and well-being. So there's three very practical things in answer to that person's question of how you can improve your light is, one, meditate. Two, work at more gratitudes. And, and three, find your strengths and strengthen them. That is everybody's homework. You all have an assignment. I love this. We love tools, Jim. We love tasks. And just last week, I realized I'd gotten in a little bit of a spiral. I was feeling a little down. And I asked the guides, what do I do? And I just heard, you've forgotten to focus on gratitude. And instantly, you see the world differently. You don't just feel mm -hmm. differently. You're drawn to see the positives. We are the ones that are creating this, this network, this this nervous system around our earth. So taking charge with these kinds of tools is powerful. It's really important. Uh, again, Marcia used to talk about the example of a tree. If the tree is like our, our life and, and the leaves are like the various issues in our life and we can have a lot of problems, but if we try and tackle the problems on the level of the leaf, it doesn't work. You no, know, we have to water the root, go to the unseen inner aspect. So that's the meditation. But things like the gratitudes are like, doing pruning and, and shaping, working to make sure things go. When we when we align ourselves with gratitude, we're, we're doing one of the most effective things we can on a conscious level to align ourselves with our inner true self because it starts to align with being in the present, to being what's, what, what is. We don't have to. And what is is so often good. We, we, you know, people talk about being real, you know, you, you're, you're just, you're being too ethereal. You're being too, you know, too much in the sky. I have, 
I have to interrupt you, Jim, because your signal is kind of flaky right now, and you are looking really ethereal. It's making cracking me up the synchronicity of this. You're you're kind of wispy and going in and out, and it's like I got goosebumps. It's like spirit is saying, "Don't take yourself so seriously here. Just just love each other. Just love each other. You're not as solid as you think." We're not as solid as we think. We're pixels, and we're we're like a hologram. So, but the point is, we want to be working on the external, and one of the best ways to work on the external is to function on the internal first. So we we augment, we get organized on the internal, but on the external, we can organize by being in gratitude. We can, and and it's real because it's you know I I use the example again. I think an example so much of the time. If you go to a buffet restaurant. You know, you, you would likely take the things you think that will taste good and, and be good and, and not give you indigestion. You wouldn't purposely say, now that looks pretty bad. I'll take some of that, please. But we do that with our thoughts all the time. Oh, yeah. We, we fill our plates with emotional food that's going to give us indigestion for hours. And it's like, why is that? Is that more real than the good nurture, nurturing food? No, it's just as real. And so... We need to choose from the buffet of life that's going to lead us to feeling more happy, more fulfilled, and that is not wispy or or wishy washy. It's 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 what's going to give us more light to give to people. Absolutely, I feel that is a beautiful note to end this on. Unless you'd like to leave us with any final thoughts you didn't get to cover yet. Well, I think I I, I think it's always nice to finish with a quote from Sanaya. Uh, <laughs> Let me see if I can find one here that I think would be good. But maybe we're running out of time. No, we're good. We, we, nobody's going to give us the cut sign. I got. I saved one here, but now I got my papers all over the place. So hold on. Just Daily second. messages from Sanaya can always be found at dailyway.org. And any day now we're going to have the Awakened Way app for smartphones, which is going to put those daily messages right in your hand, 4,500 of them to inspire you. I love what you said, Jim, while you're looking about what you feed yourself. You wouldn't put a plate full of nasty food on your plate. And yet are some of the conversations over meals are downright toxic. Toxic, toxic. I yeah. mean, it's like, yeah. and people will say, they'll share one thing and then say, oh, that reminds me of this trip when I had this terrible experience. Oh yeah, I had one too. It's like, if you get an hors d'oeuvre that tastes really good, you would enjoy it. But if you got an hors d'oeuvre that tastes really bad, you want to think, hey, waiter, I'd like another one of those crappy <laughs> hors d'oeuvres. You know, so we should be really conscious of what we metabolize in our thoughts. Amen. One of the things that, that Snai was talking about was power and the one from um, earlier this year in 22. And your true power is awareness. Remain aware that all of you share the same source, that you are all arise from one mind. That to me is a very important concept that if we just start to, we keep finding ways to tune in back to the point that we're whole, we're joined, you know, that, that point that we're, we're much more than this body, that we're part of this web as you talk about, and that love is the basis of it all. Those are the three points you have on your point. And it's like, those you can't beat those. Those are very powerful concepts. And so the more we can memorize them and remind ourselves of them and live them, that's the most important thing, to find ways to live them. It's well to think about how other people could change or what other countries should do or what leaders should do. We need to be our own leaders. We need to be tuning into our own natural law and live our life as full as possible as examples and, and for the fun of it, if nothing else. Well, we're here for the full experience and our bodies let us know which direction to go. There's comfort and discomfort and love really feels awesome. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jim. It, a pleasure to talk with you. I hope you all have enjoyed uh, hearing a little more about the noosphere. And I, I do feel there's hope for humanity. What's your view on that, Jim? I, I totally do. I, I think, I mean, again, the one thing I said last time is since I feel that consciousness is primary and that it's been there all along, it's just emerging now. I don't think that life has evolved this far to extinguish itself. I think that it, what we need is to keep the broader view that natural law is wise and, and loving and we're, we're safe. We don't have to have fear. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So fear not, as Sanaya says all the time, focus on your thoughts, be aware of your thoughts and upgrade them. That's the best use of free will. I love you all. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you here again next time.